Welcome to the Walker Art Center. I'm Cheryl Mosley, I'm the film curator here and I'm pleased to see you here. It feels like we're back at the Walker Cinema. Has everybody missed it? We haven't been here for a while. <laughs> Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we are here with Jay Rosenblatt for our, our filmmaker in conversation. Jay Rosenblatt was born in New York. Uh, he currently is living in San Francisco. He's been making films since 1980. Uh, while he also shoots film, uh, most of the films in this retrospective have, are from found footage, works that are uh, taking film pieces from many sources and carefully creating works from them. Uh, so we're pleased to have him join in our annual Filmmaker in Conversation series. Last night we saw a program of Jay's earlier work and uh, in Walker's lecture room, which is just right next door outside of the cinema in the next room over, uh, we're showing two of his short works, King of the Jews and Prayer, and they will run continuously uh, through the end of the month. So if you haven't had a chance to see them, you can come back and see them at, uh, anytime when the galleries are open. I wanna thank the Academy. I love to say that. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences for supporting filmmakers in conversation at the Walker Art Center for the past three years. And I also want to thank Michelle and Bill Polad for their generous support of this program. After tonight's program, uh, which runs about 70 some minutes, uh, Jay will be back for a post-screening conversation. And I just want to make one note that in the program that you've had in your, in your, in your program notes, um, we've had a little slight change of order. We're going to start with Afraid So and then follow with Phantom Limb. So please welcome Jay Rosenblatt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the Academy. <laughs> I, need, I needed to say that. Um, but I'd also like to thank Cheryl and Jenny and the folks at the Walker for bringing me here. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. I had a program, that actually a very similar program to the one last night showed here 10 years ago uh, without me, just the films. And it's always nice to follow your films at some point to see where they showed. And now I'm here with this new program. So I'm, I'm very excited uh, to be here and I'm going to be excited to hear your comments and questions, so I hope you stay after the show. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the films beforehand. I think it's better for you to experience them without um, help, in a sense, and just just um, just get the, the the raw reaction. I will say that the just give you some time frame, so because sometimes I think with um, certain kinds of films, it helps to know how long they are. Um, the first film, Afraid So, is three minutes, and there's a, uh, a Minnesota connection, which you'll see right away. Um, the second film, Phantom Limb, one of the anchors of the program, is 28 minutes, um, and it, it, I finished that in 2005. The third film is called I Just Wanted to Be Somebody, 10 minutes, um, I think I finished that in 2000 and seven, maybe? I, I, they all kind of blend together. Um, the fourth film is the other anchor of the program. It's called The Darkness of Day, and that's a more recent film, 2009. Um, it premiered Telluride. That's where I saw Cheryl again. And, um, and then the very last film is a brand new film. It's called The D Train, and it's, oh, I'm sorry, Darkness of Day is 26 minutes. And the D train is five minutes. So I hope you enjoy the show, and I will be here after. Thank you. I really want to thank, uh, thank you for applauding and applauding again for Jay, Jay Rosenblatt, who's come here from San Francisco to share his films with us and to have this conversation tonight. So please, again, welcome Jay Rosenblatt. <laughs> Thank you. I always feel like you need a little breath after some of those films. But um, I'm going to start the conversation, and then we're going to open it up to the audience in just a few minutes. But I just wanted to say that what we have just watched is a program of these five short films. Uh, we saw Afraid So, Phantom Limb, uh, I Just Want to Be Somebody, The Darkness of Day, and then your very newest film, 
uh, the D-Train. So I thought we would start with the D-Train uh, because it's so full of life, you know, in some way. Even though it's an older man, a, a man riding the train, seeing his life pass by. Maybe Would you mind just start, starting by talking a little bit about making that film? Uh, sure. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of ironic because it's, it's so full of life, but it's about his death, really. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't, that, that film was on the back burner for a, a while. I um, came across, it, it went through several permutations, but when I finally came across the footage of the old man, I realized I had a structure for the footage I had been collecting. And um, it, it came together, w once I found that, uh, it came together pretty quickly for me, because uh, some of the films you saw were, uh, took like three hours, uh, three three hours. <laughs> I wish three year three years. Uh, the, the two long films took uh, three years. Uh, actually, Darkness of Day took even longer. Um, so this one, uh, in in a matter of like two or three months, I had uh, pretty much finished it. And um, I had two versions. I had one version uh, with um, some a, a different soundtrack. Actually, some Arvo parrot music, which you uh, hear a lot in Phantom Limb. And then I had this uh, version with uh, Shostakovich. And I played it for a few people, and, and unanimously everyone said the Shostakovich, because it, uh, it was much more uh, buoyant and, and just had a, 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 a it, was, it was a nice juxtaposition to the material, whereas the Avro Par was more underscoring the gravity of, of mortality. Um, and it, it was the right decision. So that's kind of how that all came together. And, and then I had this, uh, this week of, of this program pretty much at MoMA in New York. And um, that was a motivator to get it done. I wanted to kind of sneak preview it there mm -hmm. and uh, just to do something extra for that show. And um, I'm, I'm originally from New York, from Brooklyn. And the D train was the train that I, I took in. It actually, the original title was different for this film. And when I happened upon the D train, then, then it was done. It was like, yes, it, of course, it has to be called the D train. Um, for, for many reasons. You can imagine the significance of the letter D and, and the themes of the film. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this might be your dark uh, series of films in some way, seeing them here tonight and seeing them back to back. Um, if we just even go back in, in, in time with the one right before that, The Darkness of Day, mm -hmm. which is an amazing film that looks at suicide and that you're not unwilling, of course, to take on these kind of uh, very deep um, um, ideas of, of life and death mm -hmm. as you have throughout this whole sort of series, series tonight. But I was always intrigued with this film at the beginning when it says that all of these films were the, that you've taken them from were pieces that were you know, thrown away, saved from the dump, from uh, schools and sort of educational films. And so every time I see this film, I always look at it and thinking about what were, what were those films about, you know, <laughs> to, have, to have this so much about suicide and what were they, what were they teaching in schools and, and where, did, where did they all come from? But uh, I don't know, I, I know, so there's two parts to that really about yeah. finding that material to support the idea that sure. you set up about suicide, but then also the making of that film as well. Um, you know, interestingly enough, a lot of the images uh, are from films that had nothing to do with suicide. It's just the context I put it in makes it seem mm -hmm. that way. Um, obviously, there's some shots that are clearly about that. But many of them just kind of allude to that because the stories are so much about that, uh, that uh, in voiceover. Um, you know, like the dolphin story, for mm -hmm. instance, or um, even the Hemingway doesn't talk at all about his suicide. It's a, it's a, it's it's a educational documentary about Hemingway's life, but mm -hmm. it really doesn't get into how he killed himself. Uh, s s certainly not during the bullfight scenes. Mm -hmm. um, one, there was one film in particular uh, called, I think it was called, A Cry for Help, and that was. Uh, you see several of the shots in the film that are specifically about suicide come from that film because that, that film actually used people that had attempted suicide to reenact some of the scenes that they went through. And that was made for a mental health uh, division, uh, Missouri Mental Health. So it was a public domain film actually made by George Stoney, who's a pretty mm -hmm. famous documentarian. 
and he did it as a gun for hire for, uh, I think it was the Missouri uh, Department of Mental Health. And I called him and, and he actually, you know, sent me the print and said, you know, I could use it. Um, so that film was probably, the, the, those images, like the woman slitting her wrists and um, the uh, woman getting the tube up her nose, that was from that film. And also the gut, when, when you see guns uh, pointing at people or the guy sitting in the bed, that was from that film. Um, and then there's a, one other direct suicide image of the, uh, the man on the ledge, and that was from an old newsreel. That was, a, I guess, a famous moment, in the, I think, in the 30s or 40s. So was there another well, part to that, that question? question? I don't know, but I think maybe we should just go through the whole program yeah, a little yeah, bit, sure. and then we can come back, because the one before that was about Anita Bryant. And even though that felt very, very dated in a way, because of the time in the 1980s, and you see Reagan, and you see all of that's going on, that all going on. But somehow it comes full circle to today and feels a little uh, uh, timely, timely <laughs> again. Uh, what, with, you know, with what happened with uh, David Warnerovich's film, A Fire in My Belly, which was pulled from the, a National Portrait Gallery show in December and other things that are happening, uh, you know, in, in our, you know, discourse today. Yeah. Yeah, uh, when I first um, showed this film, um, I think it was at the Mill Valley Film Festival, I had sh screened it there. Um, and it was when Sarah Palin was coming to prominence, and it just felt like we're seeing this all over again with this kind of uh, uh, fundamentalist, ignorant energy out there. Um, and you know, someone that is kind of a beauty queen and uh, espousing all these views. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was very timely, actually. And it, and and some people um, think that. The whole Anita Bryant campaign was, uh, uh, I know a lot of gay people consider that a second Stonewall. Because a lot of people came out of the closet at that time. Um, yeah, I guess you could say in some ways that's another dark subject. Uh -huh. yeah. I, I think you're all kind of dark. Yeah. <laughs> I go, I go all little, the way through. Little smatterings of humor here and there. I think but. there's enough, yeah, enough to, to, bring them, to bring them up. But Phantom Limb, of course, is a very, very personal story. Yeah. I mean, you really did lose your brother, and so you tell that in quite a touching uh, way, going through the, I think it was 10 steps. Of, 12. 12 steps, thank you, uh, of what, what your process was, or what a process is about losing a family member. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, that film, even seeing it now, and I've seen it many times, and I've lived it, um, it still affects me. Um, so that, that's a good sign for me. Um, that was a very difficult film to, to make. It took me about 20 years to begin that film. Um, I knew I had that film in me because I had that experience in me. And at one point I thought I'd uh, write a narrative script about a family coming to grips with losing a child. But um, when, when I was ready to have a child myself, um, I, I was ready to make that film. And it, they went hand in hand, really. Mm -hmm. And when I was ready to make that film, I was ready to have a child. Um, so that was, a, that was quite a journey, the whole experience from, from uh, going through it, obviously, to, and, and it's in the film, I don't have to repeat it, but to finally uh, turning it into something uh, creative was a, a big part of the healing process. And I really wanted to hopefully make a, a film that could be healing for other people that have been through some kind of loss. Um, and it certainly was healing for my family. Um, I, I, was a, I was nervous to show it to my parents. And it was, uh, I mean, it was a great moment, but it was really difficult to show it to them. And very, a, lot of, a lot of tears. But it felt like uh, coming full circle in some ways. So, yeah. Sometimes there's a lot, you know, said or written about your life that uh, sets you on this trajectory of exploring these difficult subjects by first being uh, working as a psychologist and then going into a f to becoming a filmmaker and carrying maybe some of that with you. But I'm really curious, sort of, I mean, 
those are two separate kinds of activities, but there feels like there's a real creative force underneath all of that that led you first to one and then to the other, and to have your work be so much about complex emotions and the way people work within them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, um, actually, I think my brother's death when I was that young really shaped my whole life. I, I had, had, didn't really know it at the time. But even going into psychology uh, initially in college was a way of trying to make sense of what had happened. Because at, at that point, I st my freshman year of college, I still hadn't talked about it with anyone. I was still in that state uh, that I'm trying to describe in the first chapter of the film. And um, it was kind of when I started reading about magical thinking, for instance, that children think they cause things that they don't. It was just a revelation, and it, it kind of put me on the path towards wanting to help other people. And um, so I majored in psychology as well as English, but then went on to uh, counseling graduate school and um, had a real desire to be part of the healing process. And then I took a film class while I was in graduate school for counseling, and I fell in love with film. And... Um, that kind of shifted me in another direction. But I, I, and looking back, I always feel like the motivation is still there. Uh, it's just a different way of expressing it. So instead of a one-to-one one -one or even in a group of uh, seeing someone week after week, maybe year after year, uh, I'm trying to, in, in some of the films, not all of them, certainly some of these, uh, creating a, uh, an environment or, or a situation where people can think about themselves and maybe open up some wounds. Uh, I once had this, uh, I, ha I showed a film in uh, Switzerland at a festival called Locarno Film Festival. And I was uh, hanging out at a cafe and met this British woman. And she wasn't there for the festival. She said, why are you here? And I, I explained that I had this film and I talked about this film. This was a film that showed last night. And she said, oh, I see, you're, um, you're opening up wounds to let the poisons out. She was a nurse. And I just thought that was such a good way of phrasing it. And I really, I, I feel like there's some truth to that, mm -hmm. uh, especially with these films. Yeah. So if you weren't here last night, to know that you know, Jay has made many, many films. And these are, of course, you just saw five of them tonight. And we showed five other ones last night. Uh, and most of the ones that we've been showing are these that have been constructed out of found footage and, and telling a story in a new way. And of course, you also shoot films as well and uh, you know, have other kinds of films. But I thought we thought that this sort of grouping would, would come together, making these about constructive films. Is there, is there a way you talk about these films? Is it, you, know? Uh, you know, it varies, but I, I, I think of them as kind of collage essay films. Certainly would like to see if there are people who are interested in joining this conversation. Uh, there's uh, ushers in both aisles that have microphones. And if you do want to ask a question, just let them know. And if you wouldn't mind standing when, when you ask your question so that we can see, see sort of who is, who is asking it. And we'll, we'll open it up to, to go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I'm curious that your parents um, did make home movies. And I'm always very jealous of filmmaker friends whose parents made movies of them. Yeah. And I, but I also can see that footage you used as a source of a lot of pain, maybe for them and you too. But first of all, did they do a lot of footage of you and did they continue after your brother's death? Uh, very little after he died. I mean, there's, I think my sisters resent that because <laughs> they don't have a lot from their childhood. But my dad had a, a regular eight camera and projector and he, not, not a whole lot. I would say maybe 10, 15 rolls of film that, he, that I have now. But I'm so grateful that he did do that. And I made it a real, a real conscious effort to, to do that for my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's really a, a treasure to have. And um, I think it, with Phantom Limb, to start it, start it off with the actual home movies really really helps a lot with that film. Right, and did I see um, some other images of your brother in some of the other films? Or was it just? Like, no, not at all. No? Just, just okay. the opening, the color footage. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm glad you felt that way, because I try to, 
I try to make these films cohesive, even though the sources are from many, many, many different films. I, I, I like when it feels like a whole and when people feel like that's maybe the same character. Yeah, they do. They do. I really like them. Oh, good. Like Thank you. Oh. Oh. Okay, go ahead. I, and then uh, we'll go over here next. I want to just commend you for your ingenuity in circumventing the uh, unnecessary expenses of actors and lighting. <laughs> uh, I'm married to a filmmaker, and I know how terribly wasteful the uh, enterprise of making a film can be. Right, if, uh, right. I'm all about recycling. <laughs> Do you have a garage where you keep an archive of old films? I, I'm a dumpster diver myself, and yes. I don't know where to keep stuff. I have a basement with hundreds of films. And... Um, yeah, I mean, actually, I, I, there's some truth to what you're saying because when I first started working this way, I didn't start out this way. I started working with actors and script. Um, and um, there were several reasons that I think, looking back, why I went in this direction. Uh, one was I found it so stressful to work with a large crew, actors, and not be able to pay people. So I kind of said, until I have a budget, I, I can't work this way, or I'll have a, a breakdown. Um, and two, two is, um, it, at first it was like, th this footage exists, maybe I can do something with it. And editing is my favorite part of the filmmaking process, and this is editing intensive. And so some of it was also budget, just not having the funds to, to do other things. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot, depending on what footage you use, it can turn into a very expensive, believe it or not, if, if other people have the rights to the footage. It can cost more than if you had shot something. But it wasn't, uh, also part of it was some of these ideas seemed to really speak to the kind of footage I was using. Um, so uh, to recreate it would have felt a little false to me, even though I could have re redone some of these scenes live action. And in Phantom Limb, I did shoot some of the footage that you saw, like the sheep sharing I shot and, uh, and the interviews. I wanted to ask about two things. I guess the first one was the sheep sharing in particular. It seems to be like uh, maybe the climax of that film. And it seemed, it, but it uses sort of a completely different language than the rest of the film. So it's very uh, shocking in that sense. It, it's, was, your intention to to sort of get to that point and say, well, maybe this, which is a key moment, is uh, one what I want to say. This is not such a terrible thing. Or you should be able to get over it. Or I, I don't know. It seems like a very uh, dramatic way to say to say that um, you, changing all the language in that in that moment yeah. is a dramatic way to do it. It is very different. I, um, guess, the, I guess the yeah, other. Yeah, go ahead. Well, maybe it's a different question. Um, when I first had the idea to make this film, and I was first writing some grant proposals, I always had uh, a sheep sharing scene in the proposal. So it was in the idea from the very beginning, and, and a slow motion sheep sharing scene. Um, and I, I had a friend, a filmmaker friend, that had gotten a camera, um, found a camera that was used in uh, scientific experiments, and you could actually shoot 500 frames a second, 16 millimeter. So I had the means to do that. Uh, it turned out, uh, this is a little aside, uh, I'll digress for a second. When I got the footage back, it was too slow. <laughs> um, it was 10 minutes, the sheep sharing scene, and I knew the length, I knew approximately the length of my whole film, and it would have thrown the rhythm of the film way off. I couldn't have a chapter that was that long in, in this film. So I actually, had to speed up what I had spent so much time slowing down. Um, but still, it's very slow. So you could, but the original footage was amazing. You could actually see the blades moving of the shear. Um, what I didn't know was how I was going to use it. I just knew it was going to be in the film. I had no idea what the sound would be, where it would end up in the film. Um, so that was a, a process of experimentation. Um, I tried uh, lots of different music. Um, and then I found this book that um, was all about advice for grieving parents. I took about eight of those 
uh, pieces of, there was like 100. A lot of them were, I thought, kind of inane, but there were about eight or nine that were really good, and then I wrote a few. Uh, and it just seemed like a, a good way to, a good juxtaposition. Uh, I thought the metaphor of shearing a sheep um, wasn't so much that you'd get over it. It was just more about the kind of, um, well, a few things. One is it was about losing something, but something that is renews itself. Also, it, to me, it was about vulnerability. And the sheep look so vulnerable and raw. And that's part of how I, I experienced that. My parents experienced that. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy the way it, it fit in with the film, but I really didn't quite know how it would until I actually started making the film. It's a very, I said this last night, but it's a very organic process. I, I don't always know exactly where things will fit, how, where it'll go. And um, it's a, it can be a little unnerving, but I've been doing it long enough where I just have this faith that eventually it'll work out. I mean, one of the dictums that I lived by with the filmmaking is I don't finish a film until I think it's ready. I don't have, uh, it's one of the advantages of not having um, like TV behind your films or deadlines in that kind of way because uh, it, it allows me to just keep working on it until I really feel satisfied. And that's, that's not always the case with filmmaking. There's a question here and a question there. Hi. Um, just kind of off that idea you're talking about there, I'm just curious with this with kind of filmmaking where, you know, you have found footage versus your own personal or collected writings. Just curious about the process of, um, you know, with these kind of films, when you write them, is it like how much of it is that sense of starting with the words and like the journal entries or your own personal writing, and then finding images to go along with it, or do, versus maybe finding images and you hold on to them for years, hoping for a project that'll work for it. How that kind of that give and take between finding images that you like, you really love, and trying to find words for them versus finding words and searching for images in a wide variety of found footage. Mm -hmm. um, well. You know, it, it, it kind of goes both ways and it depends on the film. Last night I showed a lot of films that actually uh, the idea for the film came from seeing an image and then a, it sparked an idea. The, 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 the program tonight was kind of the opposite. I had the ideas and then looked for footage. Or I had the footage already, but I didn't know how I was going to use it. I just knew that I was drawn to some images unconsciously. So I collect a lot of images, not always knowing how they'll be used. Uh, with Afraid So, I heard this poem by uh, this woman, uh, Jean Jeannie uh, Beaumont, on, on the radio. Uh, it was Garrison Keillor's uh, Writer's Almanac. And I, 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 I never had this feel, feeling, but I heard it and I thought, I, this would make a good short film. I didn't even know who, I, I, so I did a little sleuthing on the internet and found her and got permission basically, after talking to her for a while and sending her my earlier work. So that, that started with the written word. Um, Phantom Limb started with the emotions and the idea and the experiences, the memories, and I started writing, but it was a back and forth thing, collecting footage, writing some more. Um, the interviews carried some of it, so that was a different way of working. And uh, Darkness of Day, I actually work with a co-writer. I collected a lot of, um, I collected all the stories. And then I told him, I, I just, I met, the, uh, he's a friend of a friend, and we were at a party together. He said, what are you working on? I told him about the film. And he said, I don't know if you're aware of this, but my, my brother killed himself. And I said, no, I didn't know that at all. And I, and I, I knew he was a writer, and I said, would you be interested in working together, maybe? And he thought that would be a good idea. And then he gave me the journals his brother wrote, or excerpts from the journals. And I thought it was amazing, his brother's writing, very uh, almost uh, 19th century style writing. So uh, that gave me the idea to weave the journal writing and the stories together, and he helped me uh, rewrite some of the stories. So 
that I had a script for that, and then I was uh, working with finding the right images to go with a lot of the part, parts of the script. But even even so, there's still a lot of shifting around, and one line might not work so well with a certain image, and then you move it, and then it's perfect. So that's that's kind of how those came about. Where um, I just wanted to be somebody, uh, just to talk about that for a second, is um, I had thought I was going to make a much longer film about Anita Bryant. I had, uh, through without getting to this whole story, but I had access to her home movies, which is kind of rare and amazing to have access to a, you know some public figures' home movies. And um, I wrote a, a grant proposal for a much longer film about her life and. I was going to tie it in with other things. And um, I couldn't raise the funds, really. I got a very small uh, development grant, had done some interviews, cut a, uh, a fundraising clip. And then um, I didn't want to just drop it. I, I didn't want to fundraise for five years. It wasn't the kind of project I felt uh, passionate enough about to do, to do what I knew would, would be required. But I didn't want to let it go. So I turned it into a short. and. Uh, I uh, actually hired a gay writer to write the letter, somebody I had known. Um, and he lived through that, and he could uh, kind of give it a gay perspective. And that's how that came about. But I did know that I'd use the whole movies with the letter. And I knew it would be a letter to Anita. And basically, I commissioned him to just write this letter to Anita. It was What he originally wrote was twice as long, and I cut it down to the essentials, and I, I thought it Nicely. So, can I just interject and ask? Do you still have rights to Anita Bryant's home movies? I mean, is there still a? <laughs> well, I don't. I don't own, I mean, them, no, but the, own them, but the archive, the Florida uh -huh. Moving Image uh -huh. Archive, uh, allowed me to use them because uh -huh. they had. They do this festival. Uh, they did do this festival for several years, uh, an archival festival, and they had me mm -hmm. down there a couple times. Mm -hmm. So, basically. I gave them some of the interviews I did, and they let me use the footage at no cost. Without getting, again, into all the details, I had met with the director of that archive mm -hmm. the, the day Anita Bryant's ex-husband donated the home movies oh. to the archive. Oh. And he was in San Francisco just meeting me because I was going to be coming down there. And he said, oh, you know what happened today? And that led to mm -hmm. nobody's ever made a film about her. I should do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, my question, um, part of the question has actually been asked by the previous um, person. Uh, but my question is, and I kind of want to focus on process a little more, mm -hmm. um, especially process of collecting. Um, do you collect systematically, say collect based on themes, or do you just collect whatever is available? If you, do you go to a college, for instance, and say, hey, here I am again, can I have your trim bin? <laughs> or do you say, do you have films about this particular subject that I can Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's kind of uh, been both. Uh, I like in the... Um, um, Cheryl was talking about the opening credit of uh, The Darkness of Day. I was just in the right place at the right time in the 80s, late 80s, uh, early 90s, where school districts were just throwing out uh, all their 16 millimeter prints, because they were all going to video instead. And uh, the San Francisco Unified School District called, my, called me and some other filmmakers and said, we're throwing these out. If you want them, come this day. So we were like kids in a candy store, just taking film after film, but just by title. So I was taking films that just, I thought the title interested me. I had no idea what some of them were about. Some of them I did know what they were about, and I just, I, I'm interested in history, and so I took a lot of World War II films. Um, and then the same thing happened with the San Mateo School District, and I was teaching at a community college at the time. They called the film department and said, we have, we're throwing out these films. Do you want it for your students? So again, like thousands of films were dumped in this uh, open um, building at the school. And for a year, I just 
put together an archive for the students to make found footage films and also took films for myself. That the title sounded interesting. And then uh, each summer when I wasn't teaching, I would spend hours each day just looking through the films, cutting out just, uh, I kind of went into, a, uh, in, in a way, an altered state and just would go through them very quickly on rewinds, not even project them, just go very quickly. I'd see something that caught my eye or unconsciously interested me, and I would just cut it out and then uh, kind of create my own reels of images that some, for some, I didn't always know why, but interested me. And then I'll have an idea for a film and look through some of that footage I've collected, try to place it in certain uh, scenes, uh, segments, and then I will go to other archives looking for images that deal specifically with the subject matter. So it's a, and then I kind of fill in the holes. With something like the last film, the D Train, I, that was all from my own, bless you, that was all from my own archive. And uh, I didn't have to go elsewhere. <clears throat> Thank you, Jay, for a wonderful uh, creative program. Uh, this may be slightly off the topic, but uh, I, I know you're a programmer for a major film festival in San Francisco. And I wonder if you could speak to the relative uh, advantages and disadvantages of being a professional filmmaker as you program that film festival. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the, I kind of fell into this uh, new role because uh, teaching for me had dried up in San Francisco. I needed a day job. And just when I was looking, starting to look for work, other kind of work, uh, the program director of the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival was leaving. And I applied for the job, and I got it. And uh, the advantages are. Um, the contacts that I've had through all these years of making films. Um, like, for instance, I just went to Sundance, not as a filmmaker this time, but as a programmer. And I knew a lot of people there. And I was able to um, network and make some contacts that I think did help and will help with getting some films that we want. Um, also, I kind of had uh, already experience working with distributors and knowing how to negotiate around that and, and it, to get the films. Uh, and I, you know, I love film, so I think it, it has, make, being, being a, a filmmaker, but also viewing a lot of films, I think has uh, made it so that I have a good eye for, for work. So those were all the advantages. Uh, uh, there's not a lot of, dis the, the only big disadvantage is it's so time consuming I can't make films. That's probably the biggest one. And it's also a little strange to be in these uh, settings where I'm usually seen as a filmmaker, but now I'm seen wearing this different hat. So even at Sundance, I was, it was hard not to say I'm a filmmaker also. I, I just, it, it's hard to give that roll up. Although it, there's, there's some really great things about the other role, too. Uh, going back to the previous question the gentleman just asked, um, how do you remember these things? Do you, or do you have the, this uh, tremendous indexing system or something short, or do you just remember all the images in your head that you've collected over the years? Or? Oh, no, N not at all. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many times for each film, and sometimes several times for each film, that I just look at everything again. So, you know, I just, I have it all in my computer now. Uh, I, I work on an Avid now. So I have, you know, bin after bin of footage, and I just look through it all again. Um, no, I don't remember. I, sometimes you'll remember something very, very unique. But for the most part, I have to go through it again. And it, you know, it, it, it's time consuming, but it's also enjoyable, too. Can I jump in here as well? I mean, talk about time, I'm sorry, time consuming and patience and tenacity to make a film like this. 
Uh, these are amazing attributes you have, uh, especially patience. I think it must take to make any, especially the phantom limb, for example, which you said was 20 years or three years uh, for the darkness of day. Uh, can you talk about what sustains you a little bit over that time to keep, keep working? Well, I, first of all, I, I didn't mean to <laughs> suggest that I worked on phantom limb for 20 years. years. Well, I mean, it's in <laughs> it was, in, it was <laughs> gestating I mean, for 20, 20 years, years okay. but I worked on it for like three years. Um, I, th I don't know if it's patience, because I'm a pretty impatient person. I think it's more perfectionism that mm -hmm. keeps me, uh, that wins out mm -hmm. over the impatience. Yeah. So I'm just not, I'm just not ha if I'm not happy with it, I can't release it into the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I don't see myself as patient. Um, and I also have, I always bring in some very trusted friends uh, at many stages of the filmmaking process, and some of them say, it's, you know, they even though I want it to be done and ready, they say you know, it's not ready, and I know they're right, mm -hmm. and I fight them a little, and then I, then I go back to the drawing board and try to make it right, mm -hmm. so that helps bringing in some other people. Yes, oh, um, I have a question um, regarding your. The way you approach the films, I know it, it's personal because it's kind of a catharsis for you, you know, for your experiences. But at the same time, do you have, is it just a catharsis, like you make a, you know, a recollection of how you felt it? Or do you have, like before you start, the goal to end, you know, this dark, you know, gloomy, um, you know, catharsis with a little bit of an, you know, like optimistic note? I mean, that's what I feel from your, from yeah. your films, like, you know... Yeah, we, we, you know, there was a lot of all of this, but in the end, like in that one about, you know, suicide, you have this child who's, you know, going through this very, you know, like traumatic experience with his dad that seems to be, you know, suiciding. And you see, but, you know, the problem is already there. You, you say that in the movie at the, at the, at the end. Mm -hmm. So is that, does that mean like we should be in the look for, you know, in the look for something or should be like... Should we be like, you know, looking out for it so that we don't go into it? Does it have like an optimistic goal or do you just go through it um, experimentally? Well, um, you know, the cathartic aspect is just a small aspect. I'm not, I'm not making these films just so I can cathart. Um, it, it's, it, it's, I have much loftier goals. Uh, I don't know if I always accomplish them, but I really think that, you know, these, these are things that are universal. So I feel like if I can get at something that's true, other people are going to feel it. Um, and all, yeah, I think it's true. I don't like, I don't like to tag on false optimism or a happy ending, but the films do have something, uh, some sense of hope. Um, Phantom Limb, for instance, you know, it ends with, uh, it's kind of ends on reincarnation in a way. So there's something that hopeful about the, the, the connection. It, you know, it, it begins with death of a child and it ends with birth of a child. So it's really coming full circle in a sense. So you could say that's somewhat hopeful. Um, the darkness of day, uh, you know, one, one of my motivations um, what's just to sensitize people to how prevalent it is around us. And hopefully, to, if people see this film and they think of someone they know that has been having a rough time, they might be a little bit more sensitive to them uh, because it's so prevalent. It's hidden in our culture. And a lot of deaths are listed a certain way. They really are suicides. Um, and then you know, it affected my family unexpectedly while I was making this film. So it's, it's out there. Uh, I don't know if that's optimistic, but I certainly did not want to make that film with any kind of judgment about suicide. I was trying, I really was trying to not be judgmental about it. And there's so many different kinds of suicide. I didn't cover all of them, but I tried to deal with different aspects of suicide. It's not just one thing. Question about the um, uh, the copyright issues. How do you deal with those? Uh, you mentioned uh, some places where uh, they were transferring the old 16 millimeters to video, or, or they were digitizing them. But the materials are still copyrighted, right? Or how, uh, uh, you know, how do you know whether they're public domain or 
right. of copyright? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, when I, when I, I, I work differently than most filmmakers, okay? Uh, uh, most documentary filmmakers, at least, um, clear all the rights before they have the film out there, um, before they finish the film. Uh, I try to just make the film not worrying about that, and then I worry about it after. Um, and it's not the best way to work. <laughs> but I, I don't want something like that to get in the way of the creative process and to just stop the momentum. So I, I just have always believed that I'll find a way to get the rights, if it's a rights problem, after the fact. And I, so far, I've been kind of lucky. Most, but that said, most of the footage is public domain. I usually, what I do is I find, I, I, I'm, now I'm much more careful about the sources, where they come from. I do a copyright search with the Library of Congress to see about those films. If, uh, that, if a particular film still has a copyright owner, or not still, but just has a copyright owner. Some of them never were copyrighted. I then try to get the rights. Um, so uh, I've been, like I said, pretty fortunate that most of it's public domain, but sometimes it's not. And there's like one 12 second shot in Phantom Limb that cost thousands of dollars uh, just for 12 seconds. And they were giving me a great deal, they said. Um, for the darkness of the day, I took a different tact. Uh, I was I. There were a lot of films that I was using. Some of them had copyrights on them, and I decided to hire a lawyer and argue fair use, which is a le legal thing. So for that film, I got a letter that says it's it's fair use, because one of the tenets of fair use is that it's transformative. What you're doing with the imagery is transformative, and it's clearly transformative the way I'm using the images. And I'm also not taking away from the original value of those images. But there are some films that I've made that actually um, I just don't, uh, I show under the radar. I don't show it on television. I make no money on them. I just make them because I want to make them. Uh, these films uh, I've had to get clear because some of them have shown on HBO. Uh, Darkness of Day is going to be on HBO in a couple of months. So I had to clear everything. But the fair use letter took care of that. Sure. Music's another issue, though. Music is really difficult and costs a lot of money. Um, uh, with uh, You said you're working on a computer and have a lot of the found footage digitized now? Now, yeah. Now, and I know there's like archive.org and other places where yes. they have a lot of um, old uh, public domain footage. Yes. And I was wondering if you ever use that as a source for anything or just what you've uh, digitized um, yourself? I, I've used, um, in, in the darkness of day, there's um, two, sh two shots that are uh, originated, I, I saw on archive.org. There's a, the shot of the man at the end getting up from a typewriter. Um, and then there's a, one of the shots, a Japanese piece of Japanese footage. I, uh, it's a great resource. The only problem is the resolution. It's kind of low resolution. And I'm mostly starting with 16 millimeter prints, and they're beautiful. And when you combine that with something from the internet, it just doesn't look very good. Um, so I still try to get the original print, even though I might research it somewhere else. And the Japanese footage, I was able to get the print and then transfer it myself to um, do a telecine. The, the guy getting up from the, I couldn't, uh, from the typewriter, I couldn't find the print. Nobody had it that I could find. I knew the title and everything. Um, so I actually had to use that off the internet. And still bothers me a little, because you see the uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what it's called, but the, the way video looks, that, that kind of disease. Uh, I just don't like the way it looks. But it was the perfect shot for that ending. So I had to kind of bite the bullet, so to speak. I just want to pick up on the previous question. Was, um, I wanted to get your reaction to Creative Commons and this idea of sharing and how it 
ties into what you're doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I think that um, the whole notion of ownership and copyright has gotten, gotten way out of control, you know, 100 years after the death of Walt Disney and all this stuff. It's just insane. And a lot of art comes from other art. Uh, you know, it, in the visual arts, there's a lot of collage work. And um, that said, I also think that, you know, I, I don't believe in taking someone's work and just taking off the credits and putting your name on it. I think you have to do something to change it and transform it. Um, so it, it's interesting now because the internet has changed a lot of things. I mean, I, I see, all of a sudden I see my film, a film of mine, the entire film, you could stream on the internet. I never, I don't know where they got it from. I never gave it to them. It somehow ended up there. So, you know, what, what can I, I, you know, I'm working with found footage. I can't really make a big deal about that. <laughs> um, and hopefully, you know, my hope is that if somebody does uh, download it and they want to use something from that and they make some other piece of art, that would be great. You can't control it all, you know, so. Any more questions? What, okay. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. I'm fascinated by your use of black and white, and then it seems like you choose just a few colors in your work. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but that was my perception. And um, the black and white, to me, seems like it's from the past, you know, recollections from the past. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you chose to do it, or...? Um, you know, it's partially that, partially it, it's part of uh, kind of my childhood in a way. Um, sometimes I will take something that is color and turn it into black and white uh, to give the film more cohesion. Uh, sometimes I won't because it, it doesn't bother me in certain cases. But, uh, and, and then a lot of footage from like the 70s and late 60s, the color turned to red. And you'll see that occasionally in some of my images, like the Golden Gate Bridge scene is kind of red. In that scene, it didn't bother me. I thought it kind of worked with the fog and with the story. But sometimes it just looks, it doesn't look great. And I just turn to black and white, and then it's not an issue anymore. So it's, I, I, I don't, I, I, I treat it seriously, and I don't just stick things in that are color haphazardly. I, I just kind of decide on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think the black and white footage does, um, at least for me, go into the recesses of my uh, past and kind of unconscious. I don't know if there are more questions. Not really. If not, really, we have one more here, and then maybe that'll be our last question. Yeah, one thing I want to say before you ask your question is, um, you know, I know, I know these are, can be difficult films, and I appreciate people sticking around. I just wanted to say that. I was going to ask whether you, um, you find the music ahead of time, and do you edit to music, or do you find the music after you've started editing the images? Do they kind of create their rhythm, or does the music play a role in that ahead of time? Um, you know, again, it's one of those both answers because it, it really depends on a specific scene. And sometimes I am editing to the music because it, uh, like for instance, that uh, the building of the Golden Gate Bridge. I, I had that, I knew when I was uh, thinking about the darkness of day, uh, the film, I, I knew that that scene of building the bridge because I had it was going to be in the film. It's the one moment of... Uh, kind of very hopeful what, what people can do. And then it turns when it cuts to the fog footage of the bridge, how something that's kind of a monument to human possibility and ingenuity can then be turned into something that's so self-destructive. Um, I had the Schubert music, and it just worked so nicely. And so I really tweaked the images to, to have the right beats and certain points in which 
it felt very, uh, almost like a dance, the building of the bridge to the music. Uh, and then there are many other scenes where I'm editing. And in that particular film, I, I worked with a, a composer. So he was composing to the, the cutting sometimes. The, the, the uh, beauty of working with somebody that's composing is you, you can uh, really cut the way you want to cut it. When you're using pre-recorded music, you're kind of a slave to the beats of that piece. So it, it, it sort of depends. Um, when I found the uh, certain Avo Parrot pieces for uh, Phantom Limb, um, it was less about the rhythm and it was more about the tone. I, I just felt his, the vibration of that music was exactly the vibration of my film. And even, I actually hired some composers to do sound-alikes and, and try other things, and it just paled to the original. So I had to, again, bite the bullet and just pay for the rights to use that music. But it, I had no choice at that point. It was just perfect. And so I just uh, was able to, to do that. Well. Thank you, Jay Rosenblatt, for coming to the Walker Arts Center.